Let's say it is 1988 and you are playing the original Legend of Zelda. Alas, you die in battle. The next screen will have the options continue, save, and retry, but what will it look like? For my friend down the street, it looked like this. For me, it looked like that. I acquired my copy of The Legend of Zelda after he got his. The reason my screen was different was because my cartridge contained a later revision of the game. My copy had an added message instructing users how to best preserve their saves. For me, this difference begged the question, had they changed anything else? Bugs that have been fixed, bugs that haven't been fixed, artistic changes, localization differences, leftover content. I find all of these types of things fascinating, especially for cartridge games. So let's take a look at several games, some bugs, some updates, and a few hidden surprises buried in the code. For starters, let's turn to the Genesis. Sega added a crude form of region identification to the systems. By bridging appropriate points on the motherboard, the console could be from Japan or overseas, as well as set to use either 50Hz video or 60Hz video. Some games would detect that the console was from a different region than what the cartridge expected and show a message indicating as much on the screen. In this example, a North American game is in the Genesis on the left, and the same cart is in a Japanese Mega Drive on the right. The Mega Drive cannot continue from this point. This region detection is easily defeated, however, thanks to a simple modification. This Model 1 Genesis has two switches that have been added on the left side for changing the system's location and video settings thanks to running a few wires to the appropriate places on the motherboard inside. While some games would use the settings to perform a region check and completely halt progress, not all games did. Mickey Mania's programmer John Burton was well aware of the ability to defeat this region detection with ease and had a bit of fun with it. If the Japanese copy of Mickey Mania was run on a console outside of Japan, a typical message for the mismatch would be shown. Pretty standard fare. If, however, the user then changed their console to the appropriate settings with Mickey Mania still running, the game would give a rather sly response, stating, oh, this machine has somehow become an NTSC Mega Drive system, and the game execution would then continue. Of course, not all games used region detection for lockout purposes. Streets of Rage for the Genesis was originally known as Bare Knuckle in Japan. The graphics used to create both title screens are stored in this same cartridge. With Streets of Rage in a North American Genesis, changing the console to Japan results in a title screen for Bare Knuckle. Change the region back to outside Japan, press start a few times, and the title is back to Streets of Rage. Code can continue execution and simply pick up region switching on the fly. Changing the region to Japan while English text is scrolling during the intro continues the story in Japanese. Flipping back to outside Japan then continues the story in English. While we are on the subject of Streets of Rage, let's talk about the graphics on the title screen. Three playable characters pose in front of a cityscape. If a player continues to mash the start button to skip the story, this title screen pops up immediately so the game can begin. If the player instead lets the opening sequence roll, the aforementioned story scrolls up the screen, the character bios are shown, and finally the title screen is drawn in dramatic fashion. Axel's silhouette fades in as the cityscape moves to the left. Blaze and Adam's silhouettes pass over each other behind Axel and the three characters meet at the center. The screen shines bright white and then dims immediately to show all three characters. The trio shifts to the right, the title is drawn in the top left corner, and even the copyright information arrives in dramatic fashion. Despite the fact the characters aren't more than a silhouette prior to the flash, each of the three exists in full detail as a collection of tiles from their head to their knees. If we disable the first background layer, Axel disappears, and we can see a lot more of Adam and Blaze. They exist on the same layer, and priority forces a bit of overlap, but the graphics for the remainder of Blaze's right arm and right leg are also present behind the scenes. The fact this amount of detail exists makes me wonder if perhaps the title screen look and assembly sequence went through a few different ideas before this final style was chosen. Here are four title screens for Star Fox for the Super Nintendo. The far left screen is from the Japanese version. Notice the F is not as tall as the F in the center two screens. The far right screen for Star Wing is for Europe. If we are left with the center two screens for North America, for those of you with North American copies, which version do you have? Some games are released with bugs that are never fixed. Let's focus on two games containing bugs in their audio. The PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 game Ninja Spirit has a high-pitched whine during quiet moments, such as when the game is between levels or paused.
This isn't a problem with the game console circuits, but rather the software. Have you ever gone to press a button or something like a car stereo and missed? Maybe you hit a different button by accident. The programming equivalent of that happened here. The code sends a zero, as in volume level zero, to register 805 in order to mute the sound. Unfortunately, 804 was the intended register to change the volume. 805 is for stereo panning. Changing the code to use 804 removes the unwanted noise. Now to the NES. The NES version of Double Dribble is known for the speech on its title screen. At least, I feel that's a safe assumption, since whenever I mention the game to a few friends of mine, they like to respond by saying Double Dribble. It isn't a problem related to sound capabilities on the NES, but rather that the sound samples are corrupted because their bit order was reversed. So if you looked at one example of an 8-bit value used for sound, that is 10111010, that value should be 01011101. Oops. Reverse the necessary bits, and what once was Double dribble. is now Double dribble. The same fix can be implemented for the other samples used in the game. The change in quality makes you wonder, are there other games with the same backward bits problem? For these last two games, I'm going to use a debugger. Things will get a bit technical, but hopefully you'll enjoy seeing some work tweaking games behind the scenes. Earlier we talked about Streets of Rage, aka Bare Knuckle. This is Bare Knuckle 3. As part of the attract mode, the game rolls through a brief intro where Axel punches the screen to reveal the title. Press start flashes about five times, the intro continues with a letter addressed to Axel from his partner Blaze, and then a demo appears. As for the title screen, there are two variations in audio and animation that we can see. The first is when Axel yells and punches the screen. Bare Knuckle appears and we hear glass breaking. Press start to jump straight to the title screen, and some combat audio is played that lasts about as long as the flashes for press start. There is additional animation made for this screen that we don't get to see. The screen fades out before the animation happens, but we can change this. Let's queue up the title screen and watch memory location F6B0 change as the screen is animating. Even if you aren't familiar with hexadecimal, you've probably noticed that this memory location is counting down. When it reaches zero, we're done with the title screen. To get it to hang around longer, let's pause execution and just change the counter to start at a much larger number. After we resume the game, we can wait for about 10 flashes of press start and then lightning strikes. It is there, it works, and it looks good, but we never see it. Did they shorten the time the title screen was up and just neglect to move the lightning animation to an earlier frame count? Who knows? Speaking of games containing things we cannot normally see, let's talk about The Revenge of Shinobi. This one has a lot of revisions available. One early build was released to the public courtesy of the Sega Smash Pack for PC from the Windows 98 era. It retains its Japanese title, The Super Shinobi. This version contains an incomplete bonus stage area, and we are going to access it using a debugger. Perhaps you haven't given much thought to typical code execution for these games, but it is essentially a big loop that branches to other code with more loops, graphical work, user input, etc. Right now, we're just letting the opening title screen loop, the Sega logo, the attract animation, and the title. Okay, we'll halt execution here. I'm going to set a breakpoint in the emulator for address 26A. Now we'll restart the game. It stopped execution because we reached our breakpoint. I will disable the breakpoint and move over to look at the code. You can see we have indeed stopped at address 26A. To access the bonus stage, we are going to hijack this existing JSR statement in code. JSR lets us jump to another location in the ROM for execution and return back to this point when needed. Since JSR is looking to jump to the value in register A0, we will just replace the value for A0 with the code location that will get us to our bonus stage. So in the registers window, I will change the value in A0 to F3 to E. Now let's resume execution. And here we are at the unfinished bonus stage. We are pretty much limited to running around and jumping on a single screen, but it is fun to access this little remainder of what could have been. 
There is no attack function implemented. However, if we look at the pattern viewer for the graphics VRAM, are those baseballs? Makes you wonder. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short trip behind the scenes of a few cartridge games from the past. Let me know if you are also interested in these sort of things. Thanks for watching.